has had the best day? Why have you had the best day? The music? Do you like the music? Does it make you kind of want to dance? Okay, get up. Everybody get up. Everybody up. up. Put your computers down. Put your notes down. Everybody get on up. All right, so what's your name that makes you want to dance? Carly. Hi, Carly. Hi. Everybody wave to Carly. <laughs> Everybody say, hi, Carly. <laughs> Carly, what's your favorite dance move? Oh, crap. Uh, I like a, like a hip sway. Like a hip sway? A hip sway. I don't think I'm supposed to do this, but Carly, can you come here? Or just like come to the side so we can see your hip sway? Wow. I'm going to have to ask you to sign a media release form, but all will be well. OK, Carly? Oh, really? Okay. Oh, look at Carly's. I can't control it. Okay, Carly, show us your hip sway. Oh but come right here. <laughs> it's really good. It's really nice to meet you. How does it go? I'm Erica. I'm Carly. Hi, Carly. Nice to meet you. I'm going to stand over here because I don't have my mask. Uh, well, it's kind of like a little sway. That's how you walk in. That's how you walk in. Oh, yeah, when you're like, hey, I'm here. You walk into the party. Okay, everybody walk in. Like, yeah. Again. You walk in, you hear the music, you sway. I like that party. And then, depending on the beat of the song, right, you can add your hands. Okay, Andrew, can you give us, like, I'm walking into the party, and I'm swaying. Carly, come on, stay with me. Okay. Oh, yeah, this is, like, is this good? You see what I'm Oh, yeah. Hands are already in. My hands are, okay, so everybody, you're walking into the party, you're moving your hands. Move your hands a little bit. Hey. That's good. And everybody, as you're walking into the party, what do you do when you walk into the party? What do you do? Cheer, you cheer. Right, you cheer, you say, hey, what's up? So walk into the party, turn around, and say, hey, what's up to somebody you don't know? Hey, what's up? <laughs> say, hey, what's up to somebody that's really far? Hey, what's up? See, that's my mom all the way in the back, way in the back. Say, hi, mom. Everybody give her a big, like, sway. What's up, mom? <laughs> okay, thank you, Carly, that was really lovely. Do you want to learn another dance? Carly. Okay, look at this one. This one's super fun. You go like this. You go, wave it, wave it, wave it, clap. Do it with me. Ready? Okay, we go. Wave it, wave it, wave it, clap. What's your name? Will you hold my microphone, like be a microphone? To... Okay, watch this. We're going to go wave it, wave it, wave it, clap both ways. Ready? Wave it, wave it, wave it, clap. Wave it. Wave it. Okay, now like, like with Carly's hips. Yeah, everybody come on. Good. Okay, now this one's fun too. You go, pick an apple and you put it in the basket. Pick the apple, put it in the basket. Say the words. Put it in the basket. Pick the apple, put it in the basket. Pick the apple. Okay, thank you so much. Now everybody wave it, wave it, clap. Ready? Wave it, wave it, wave it, clap. Wave it, wave it, wave it, clap. Pick the apple, put it in the basket. Pick the apple. You gotta say the words. Wave it. Yes. Yes. Okay, this one's for you, Carly. Shimmy forward, shimmy back. Shimmy forward, shimmy back. Okay, now put it all together, ready? We're gonna start with wave it. Five, six, seven, eight, say it! Forward, shimmy back, shimmy forward, shimmy back. Now, Carly, do the Carly. Walk into the party like you mean business. All together. And that concludes my presentation of the welcoming. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining me in that, my friends. I hope I see you at the party on the dance floor. Lisa Weimer, shall I pass it off to you? This is Andrew, DJ Word. <laughs> Thank you, Evelyn. All right, can you hear me now? All right, awesome. So welcome, those of you in Humanities 20 know me, I'm Lisa Wymore, I'm the um, faculty advisor for Arson Design here at Berkeley. 
which is part of the Discovery Initiative. Berkeley Arts and Design connects and fortifies creative departments and units throughout the Berkeley campus, and uh, we're funded by philanthropic donations. And unique to this speaker series is its connection to Humanities 20, so welcome class. Our theme this year is Perseverance, Renewal, and Reflection. A few announcements before I do introductions of our great guests today. Don't forget that Creative Careers is coming up Tuesday, March 15th. There's a sign in for that in B Courses. It's going to be a great event to meet um, folks working in the industry, in creative fields, and artistic uh, areas. So please come to that. We also have a very full lecture next Friday, which is going to be connected to a big colloquium on um, crit called Critical Data Futures. So you want to make sure to, um, to uh, sign up to register for our talk next Friday to get in, because they'll look for your name on the registration sheet. That's also in B courses. And then remember to hold your cards till the end for questions. And then we'll collect those from our reader. You'll give those to the various readers in our class, Ashley and um, Julia. Okay, so welcome to today's talk. It's talk. It's co-presented by my department, the Department of Theater, Dance, and Performance Studies, and we have the Vice Chair of our department here, San San Juan, who will be part of the talk. Um, uh, today's talk is called The Welcoming Four. It's a conversation between Erica Changshuk and San San Juan about new pandemic-inspired forms of making that center care, listening, and hospitality. Um, and so I'll just introduce Erica Chung Shuk is a choreographer, director, and performance maker interested in expanding the way performance is created and shared. Shuk's work spans devised experimental performance and social practice and produces unexpected forms of audience engagement, similar to what we just experienced. Shuk's original works have been presented and commissioned in the Bay Area and beyond since 2000. She is co-founder um, co she co-founded For You, a performance group that brings strangers together for intimate encounters and considers performance making as a gift-giving experience. So she'll be talking about her various projects on that today. San San Kwan's uh, research, uh, Professor San San Kwan's research, uh, interests include dance studies, Asian American studies, theories of space and kinesthesia, and intercultural interculturalism. Her new book is titled Love Dances, Loss and Mourning and Intercultural Collaboration, and it's really a beautiful book, so check that out. She's co-author of Kinesthetic City, Dance and Movement in Chinese Urban Spaces, also a groundbreaking work. So please look at those um, texts. Um, and, that, and it was co-edited with Kenneth Spears, a book called Mixing It Up by Oxford um, Press. Her article on cartographies of race and the chop suey circuit, um, a group of, uh, excuse me, her book, Multicultural Subjects, is an article on um, her cartographies of race and the chop suey circuit, um, looking at Asian American cabaret entertainers who toured the nation through World War II era. And it's published in um, the TDR, Theater Dance Research. TDR stands for, wow. <laughs> sorry, I put you on the spot. No. The drama review. Thank you. Um, so we'll welcome um, San San to the stage to be asking questions and be in conversation with Erica. So before we begin, I want to recognize that UC Berkeley is located in the territory of Hui Chin, the ancestral and unceded lands of the Chochenyo speaking Ohlone peoples, the successors of the sovereign Verona Band of Alameda County, and the confederated villages of of Lashan. And we recognize that every member of the Berkeley community has and continues to benefit from the use and occupation of this land since the institution's founding in 1868. Um, this event is being recorded and will be uploaded to the Arts and Design YouTube channel with captioning for those who want to share that um, or revisit. And we will be doing um, Q&A at the end of the presentation um, involving uh, Sonson and Erica. So welcome, and I'll pass it over to you, Erica. This feels very formal to stand here at a podium, like I have something to say. Um, all right, I'm going to talk for, what, about 20 minutes or so? We'll see how that goes. Um, thank you all for being here. How many of you are students of this class that Lisa was talking about? Congratulations for being UC Berkeley students. They're all, it's, it's such, I've, I've been working at the university 
uh, just this last last semester in the fall and this semester and it's been such a joy to connect with so many people in the UC Berkeley community and the students have been just like a true joy to get to know. It's just been really uplifting and I feel like I've made many new friends and thank you Lisa and Art and Design and TDPS for having me. Um, this is a picture of my grandparents. Their names are Phyllis and Milton and they uh, they were my biggest fans in the whole world. I make performances, and I have made performances in some weird ass places, like weird bars or restaurants or theaters in like dangerous neighborhoods. Or and my grandparents uh, would drive from San Jose when they were very very old. I think they were Andrew. How old do you think they were here? They, they maybe. 60s or so, and they lived until their mid 90s. Look at that love, right? So they would drive up until, you know, they were in, I think maybe even in their early 90s, like driving their little car from San Jose, like bumpy car on 280, all the way to San Francisco and like parking in whatever neighborhood and coming to see like whatever, whatever I would do. They loved me so much, and I feel so grateful for that. And after every single show, for like 20 years, they would say, we don't understand it, but we love you, right? And that would be just their thing. Every single time, we don't understand what you're doing, but we love you, and so we're showing up again and again and again and again. And when they uh, became too ill to come see my shows, like to not be able to make that drive in their bumpy like Mazda, from the 80s, um, I started thinking about what it would be like to create a performance for them, right? What would it be like, instead of asking them to drive their little Mazda up the 280 from San Jose all the way to San Francisco and to park and walk and like arrive at the theater half of an hour early, what would it be like actually for me to make a performance that, that goes to their world, right? Instead of them coming to my world. And so I started imagining a performance that would happen in their house they lived in the same house for how long? My mom's here. How long, mom, did they live in that house? 50 or 60 years. When my mom first came to this country from Korea, she stayed in this house. Yeah, so they lived in this for a long time. So I started imagining their house as a performance site. And I started imagining what it would be like to create a series of performances as a gift for them, right? So for so much of my life, my own performance was my way of like dealing with and processing my own grief, my own confusion, my own heartache. But that really shifted when I started thinking about creating something as a gift for them. So what would that gift be for them? They would probably, it would probably involve like burlesque, right? It would probably involve strippers. It would probably involve like drag. They were like really, they just loved like big, they loved feathers, they loved jazz hands, they loved like sexiness. So, it, so those are not necessarily like things that I go to when I'm creating my own work, but if I'm going to create something for them as a gift, I wanna create something that is going to bring a kind of joy and levity to their lives, especially as they're nearing the end of their lives. So I started just thinking about what are the tools and techniques that I have developed for a long time as a theater artist, and how can I kind of slide those over uh, into, into, literally into their house, literally doing a performance for my grandma in her chair. Remember that chair? She like never left this chair. It was like in, folded around her body, and from that chair, it, she could kick back. It was one of those ones where you could kick your feet up, and she could watch TV. And there was a big sliding glass window that she could look out, and there was an apple tree that had been there for a billion years, and she slept in this chair, right? And so what would it be like to have her sit in that chair and to do a performance, you know, to have my friend Dwayne, who's like a beautiful, sexy kind of weirdo, like do a performance of like 1940s music from the apple tree. Don't sit under the apple tree, you know, this kind of thing. What would it be like for my grandpa to just be like laying in his bed and to have you know, beautiful dancers just come and surround him. So what is it like to kind of bring this into their homes? So this uh, idea of creating performance as a gift really came from my grandparents. And so I am lucky that I have these really uh, adventurous friends um, that are down to play with me. Um, this, is, this is Ryan and Rowena and myself. This is us doing a dance about raccoons. Um, and performance making really has always been uh, 
an opportunity for me to, to work with friends and to make new friends. So I came over, I came up with my friends. I said, hey, what would it be like for us to make this, this to start this project called For You uh, that um, takes this idea of creating performances as gifts and kind of moves from there? Right? What would be the first like, kind of logical step in that? So the first series of performances that we did um, were for audiences of 12 people. And so what we did was we would work really hard to recruit groups of 12 people that lived in the world in extraordinarily different ways. And we would date them for like six months. Our first date would always be in their house. We would always try to find a way to like get in their bedroom or to like go into their bathroom, like to just dig through their drawers, like ask them what the messiest place in their house is and like go there, right? And to kind of like dig into their lives and to, to come to know these, these new friends in this particular way. So we would, we would curate groups of 12 people. We would date those 12 people for about six months. And then we would create these day long adventures that brought these 12 groups of people together. Yeah. So a lot of what we were thinking about was the curation of audience. Who is it? A lot of us go to the theater and we complain like, ah, oh, why is it that Everybody that comes to the theater is X, Y, and Z, and why can't we get A, B, and C, right? But what is it to actually intentionally curate a group of 12 people that reflect who we would want to see coming to our larger performance spaces, right? We want a kind of um, intergenerational experience, right? We want people that come from very different parts of the world who live in the world in extraordinarily different ways to come use the theater as an opportunity to, to find shared uh, find a shared life experience. So we did two rounds of this where we curated these groups of 12 people. We had these day-long adventures. Um, and we started thinking about really this idea of bringing diverse groups of people together and how else can we do that. And so uh, this is another, oh, I wanted to just talk briefly just about sight. So with these groups of 12 people, we had performances at diners, at theaters, at national parks, in people's houses. So we kind of decentered the idea that performances need to happen within these kinds of spaces, which, which create a kind of environment. Like, I'm really active. You're all sitting there watching me. You're all passive. I'm like putting my heart out. You're all judging me. Like, there's this dynamic that happens, right? When audiences are just sitting and I'm like, da -da 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 -da. <laughs> so what is it like to really ask the audience to be involved in the creation of the work and to pay for the work by giving their time and their energy? Um, and then, and then to, to kind of put the performances in these various sites. The photo to the left here, those are two performers, and we did a performance in a diner. And we just, we didn't get permission, but we just took over this very weird small diner, and we just took over six booths, and we had two audience members meet two performers at these booths. So these kind of tabletop performances that happened in the diner, and all we had to do was like buy everybody some coffee and some donuts. Um, so another way that we thought to bring people together was through a piece that we called Circle of Chairs. And so through this uh, piece, we, we'd like to think of this as a folk dance. And each audience member is given this MP3 player. Andrew worked on this <laughs> with us. And um, there is a pre-recorded soundtrack on the MP3 player. And each soundtrack was different, right? So you have a circle of chairs, you have 12 strangers, you have 12 different musical tracks, and if each person listens and follows the instructions on the musical track, then what we would get is some sort of folk dance in which there, was all, there were all of these ways that people would interact. For example, um, everybody stand up and boogie with a stranger or go uh, find yourself like head to head with, if you're in chair number one and chair number five, stand up, walk to the center of the circle, press your head against your stranger's head. This is before COVID when we could do things like this. Um, and we performed this in a lot of different spaces. We performed it at a church, in a church basement, at a bar called The Stud, on my friend's rooftop, at an empty restaurant for a bunch of people that, where was that? It was like a bunch of people that worked at this restaurant uh, in Arkansas in the living room when we were on tour for a show there. So we just took these MP3 players and kind of, if you have this bag of MP3 players, 12 people can have this kind of experience of intimacy and togetherness. Um, speaking of Arkansas, 
I made a work uh, through For You called First Things First. And I wanted to talk about this because this was right before the pandemic hit. So this was a year long project. There was a new, has anybody ever been to Arkansas? <laughs> have you, where have you been? Little Rock, okay. So um, there is this uh, beautiful little neck of the woods in Northwest Arkansas, where close to Fayetteville, um, where the Crystal Bridges Museum complex is. What is the name of the town, Andrew? Why am I forgetting? Bentonville? Was that it? Okay, in Bentonville, Arkansas. So the Crystal Bridges complex is a huge art museum. Um, Bentonville is the home of the Waltons, which they founded Walmart, right? So this this city has this very complicated history, right? Of like of the very first Walmart was in is in is in Bentonville, and from there the family kind of continued to give to that community, um, and we all understand the complexity of what Walmart has become and what it means to be an arts based organization that is subsiding uh, on 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 those profits. It was a beautiful experience. So Crystal Bridges is, the, is one museum. The other museum that they opened there was called the Momentary. And they were seeing this as a kind of interdisciplinary art space. And this museum opened in February of 2020. And so they um, uh, hired us, commissioned us to create this kind of year long series of events that would um, like galvanize the public and allow for us to meet a bunch of new friends and have that culminate in a in a live performance in the new um, in the new in the new museum. So we met with we one of our collaborators in this top photo you can see is uh, a roller derby team. Yeah, down below you can see we worked with a group of Marshallese dancers. Um, we worked with a high school marching band. <laughs> and so we did all of these kinds of mini events that led up to this premiere. And so much of the work for us was around how it is that we create these kinds of experiences, these kinds of public events that engage these um, unexpected publics, yeah. So that was February 2020. And then March 2020, hey, what happened in March 2020? <laughs> okay, just kidding. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so that was profound for all of us in so many unexpected ways. Um, this is my son. His name is Wakes. In March of 2020, he was six, um, which is wild to think that now he's eight and has been wearing a mask for two years. But, you know, as I'm sure uh, you, we, we all have experiences of this, of suddenly the world shutting down and the schools shutting down and suddenly we're like homeschooling our children and like living in such an unprecedented and surprising new way, yeah? Um, so I, when, when at, early in the pandemic, I was like, oh my God, I don't, this homeschooling thing, I'm not cut out for this. Like I, they're sending us all these pages of assignments and doing things online. I was like, I don't know what, I can't, I don't know what to do. And so my very smart friend, Ryan, my collaborator, Ryan Takata, said, do home ec. Like just stick, just ignore the math and the reading. Like what would it be like to just do home ec. And so did you all take home ec in high school? Is that still, a, see, but you can see those of us who took it and those of us who did it. Does everybody know what home ec is? Does anybody not know what home ec is? It's a, okay, so super. So when I was in high school, a um, trillion years ago, there was a class called home ec in which we learned how to like cook and like sew and like mend things. And it was, a, it was a class that would prepare us to be homemakers. So there was home ec and then there was wood shop. So you fill in the rest, right? I took wood shop. But I will say <laughs> that home ec was really exciting during the top of the pandemic because we got to just do a bunch of fun crafting projects. And so the first crafting project that my son did, or maybe the second, was this pillow that he made for my mom here. Hi, mom. Everybody say hi, mom. <laughs> just a chicken. OK. Um, so Wakes and my mom like are so in love with each other. Like they really love each other more than any two people I think could love each other in, on the planet. And at the top of the pandemic, I think that you all can relate to this feeling of just being so concerned for the elders in our lives. Do you remember earlier in the pandemic when we just did not know how this thing was transmitting, when the elders were just being disproportionately affected? It was a terrifying time 
to have the elders who I love in my life. And it just was so uh, like so weird and so anti-intuitive that the way to keep our loved ones safe is to like not see them and not touch them. Like what the, f like what, what kind of logic is that? You're like, I love you. So stay home, never leave your house. Don't open your door. Don't go into the elevator. Don't come over. And like, yeah. And then my mom's sneaking out and doing all kinds of things. But anyhow, so Wakes made my mom this pillow. And you can see that he cut out his hand and he sewed it onto this pillow. And then that little uh, note says, I love you, Halmoni, on it. Um, and he gave this pillow to my mom. I think I delivered it. I like let it sit in a plastic bag, I think, for five days or something. And then went to my mom's apartment all masked and gloved and like handed it to her through the door and kept distance. I think it was maybe the first time we saw each other after a few months right? And I remember that she was just so moved to receive this little pillow. So this thing that feels like kind of a nothing thing, my mom can talk about it way more eloquently. You should all talk to her about it. But she talks about it as a replacement for touch, right? That she would sit on her couch and like have this pillow in her lap and put her hand on top of Wakes's hand and feel connected to him, right? And so my mom is a very, very touchy person. And so I think the loss of touch for all of us, but I think especially for my mom was really profound. So to have this like surrogate for touch just ended up being more meaningful, I think, than, than I could have imagined. So this gave us an idea, us being Ryan and Rowena and I, for you collective to start this project called Artists and Elders. And so I put a Facebook post up and said, hey, is anybody interested in connecting with an elder? Like, is this something, artists, artists, are you interested in connecting with an elder for some sort of creative exchange? And like within minutes, just so many people responded like, yeah, me, 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 me. Like it just felt like artists were just dying to find a way to be productive. Like we were dying to find a way to, to, to kind of use what we have, which I think as a performance artist, we know how to bring people together, right? So how do we use what we have to be, to, to make some sort of like meaningful impact in this moment that just felt so bleak. Yeah. So we basically started a dating service and what we did was we collected like hundreds of names of artists that were interested in participating and hundreds of names of elders who were interested in being paired with an artist. And we had some grant money from a project that we canceled because of COVID and we paid each artist to have three meetings with their elder. And what we asked is that they cre that the, after those three meetings, they create some sort of gift for the elder that they were connected to. And so we had theater artists who create working really out of their, out of their medium. And this is one thing that was so exciting for me. So this project, uh, this is Lauren and Jean. So Lauren is a, is, is Lauren Spencer is just a brilliant actor, writer, director and like a public per a public performer. And we paired Lauren with Jean because Jean loves the theater. And we're like, oh great, they'll do something theatrical together. And what ended up happening is that Jean shared the story of this doll that she uh, had when she was a child. And she loved this doll so much, the doll's name was Fuzzy. And what happened was Jean gave the doll, had the doll for like a billion years and then very recently gave the doll to her niece and then what do you think her niece did with fuzzy we don't know fuzzy's just gone jean's like we i saved that doll for you my whole life where did you put fuzzy and so jean was really torn up because of the loss of fuzzy and lauren really heard this so lauren also knew that jean really loved to create uh, to, to, to was really conscious of the of waste and really into like doing everything she can to save the planet. And so she created this doll out of all recyclable materials. Like the bonnet is the underwire of a bra. Um, and she just pulled together all of this trash and created this trash doll um, called Fuzzy Two and delivered this trash doll to Jean. So here we have a theater artist who's used to like writing a monologue and performing Shakespeare saying like, huh, what I want to create, like my gift, 
the most meaningful gift that I could create is actually something that's completely outside of the medium that I normally work in, right? So this just reflects the kind of like nimbleness of artists, right? That we're able to adapt, that, that we can like think creatively about how to create, how to, how to generate something that, that has kind of uh, like a very specific kind of bespoke gesture, yeah? And, um, and Jean, I think, was really quite moved by the receiving of this doll. And so Jean had been experiencing a pretty profound many, many months of isolation. And then she had this thing to talk about, right? So after like being alone and being like, how's your day? I don't know. I want... Like after the kind of mundaneness of the days, she had this like new story to tell. So we kind of realized that in addition to like the gift of the doll, what we're giving is like the gift of having this like this story to tell. There are so many examples of this project. I mean, there we've paired I forget, I think 80 artists and elders or so, and it just continues to grow in unexpected directions. I want to just tell you about a few more. So this is Robinder. Um, and we paired Robinder with Kelly. Do you all know, maybe some of you know this group called Kitka? They, they perform Eastern European music. It's a women's vocal ensemble, and they're based here in Berkeley. And Robinder is a UN ambassador. He's Indian, from India, but, but uh, lives in Japan. And when he moved to Japan, he decided he need a, needed a hobby. And so he started taking up this traditional form of Japanese singing. And I don't know the name of it. But the, the, the kind of intonation and feeling of this music felt very akin to the music of Kitka, uh, the women's vocal ensemble from, that does the Eastern European music. And so Kelly is a member of Kitka. And so we paired them thinking, oh, great, they're going to make a CD. That's what they're going to do. They're going to, they're, they're going to, they're going to create this beautiful piece of music that's going to draw on all of their, their vocal traditions. So instead, Robinder's like, look, I'm in Japan. The rest of my family is in Los Angeles. I have a lot of grandkids. I can't, like, there's a pandemic. I'm really, I'm older. <laughs> and I don't know when and how I'm going to see my family again. And um, you know, so he, he was, he was thinking about his, he was thinking about his legacy. He was thinking about like, what is it like to kind of face the end of one's life with the knowledge that we might not be able to be reunited with the people that we, that we love. And so Kelly was speaking to him about this. And, you know, I told you that we asked each artist to meet with their elder three times that never, they met, they're, they're continuing to meet. There's, these are like ongoing friendships. So she met with Robinder for months, very often, <laughs> and decided that the best way to honor Robinder's legacy is to create this website for him. So none of his professional work has been reflected on the web. And so she created this beautiful website that honors all of his work, his professional work as a UN ambassador, but also his musical interests, and then has these kind of portals for people, for his family to like give him notes, you know, easy, to, easy for him to upload notes to his large family. And so what she gave him was like this gift of, I don't know, a lifeline, like this gift of being able to communicate and this project that, that like was a, that represented his life in the way that he wanted it to be represented and the opportunity for him to be remembered in the way that he wanted to be remembered. Um, so yeah, there have just been, there have been so many different iterations of the project. We started out working uh, locally, primarily through an organization called LBFE. This is Little Brothers Friends for the Elderly. And LBFE is a national organization, but they have a San Francisco chapter that serves clinically isolated, uh, low-income elders. Yeah, so clinical isolation is like an actual, actual diagnosis. Yeah, so these are el the elders need to, in order to be eligible for the LBFE services, they need to uh, receive less than two social visits per month, and that includes visits with social workers or doctors, right? So they're, they're seeing two people per month, right? So imagine like, you're in a pandemic, you can't leave your house. Pre-pandemic, you were seeing two people per month. So you can imagine how that kind of unfolded in the course of the pandemic. The impact of isolation on elders is, is detrimental, right? It's, it's, it's it, like the, what we were seeing with some of the elders that we worked with is so many health issues were just being exacerbated. People were really 
really struggling. And we were so moved to learn that the, uh, the project was having a kind of like true impact on the, on the lives of the elders. Yeah. The final project that I want to talk about before we bring Sansan up is the great AAPI elder print off. So, um, you, it's like these tough times, tough times, friends. Um, so we all remember when, I mean, it's still happening, but when Asian elders were being attacked and are continuing to be attacked, we learned that the Asian elders that were associated with LBFE were like calling the organization to ask for support in, in new ways. And so we decided to launch the great AAP Elder Pinch Off. <laughs> and what we wanted to do was to create an activist poster making project in which we would pair AAPI elders with AAPI artists, and they would create a poster that somehow amplified the voice of their elder partner and pull a slogan from their conversations. So we just had, we had, I think, 30 of these pairs happening. So I'm just going to scroll through some of these posters. Um, this is created by a Chinatown-based artist, um, Just Be Nice. This is a beautiful poster from an artist named Randy who connected with their elder named Jasmine. To, uh, uh, Randy is a non-binary or trans uh, artist and and um, had was so excited to find a connection to an Asian elder that also identifies as trans and Randy had never had that kind of connection with an you know with an elder uh, that identifies uh, similarly to them. Um, a beautiful poster from Gen Z and Jen like created this poster but then ended up delivering coloring books to her elder ongoingly because her elder didn't like to play bingo and they only had bingo in the home that she was at and she was stuck in her room. So like artist as like coloring book deliverer. Um, each of these story, each of these posters has like, it's hard for me to not go into it deep because each of these posters reflects like these beautiful connections between beautiful people, right? And so these, the, on first glance, you're like, well, I don't understand what this is. But then, you, you know, you learn that what's happening is that L, the artist, is embroidering on L's baby blanket for their elder Morningstar um, because Morningstar miss, like, was longing for their own baby blanket in these times. This is one that I made for my aunt. <laughs> Uh, my mom loves this one because the hands are kind of a gesture of like an offering, a kind of reaching forward. This artist, um, uh, Melissa, ended up befriending uh, this elder named Weiwei, and they, they I think, have, they were going for weekly walks. Weiwei hadn't left her house, uh, hadn't left her neighborhood in like some years, and, um, you know, we organized, Melissa organized transportation to get Weiwei to the beach for the first time in many, many years. Um, this QR code leads to a beautiful uh, dance film that this artist made with their elder. Each of these has such, like, such tremendous, such tremendous stories attached to it. I'm going to kind of let you imagine. What we did was we put these posters on our website and we asked anybody to be able to print them and to put them in their windows in their homes. And so on our website, we have a bunch of installations where people have printed these just on their home printer and put them up in their houses. So this poster was created by Andrew here. Um, and Andrew created this for and with his elder Bernadette. Andrew, do you want to talk about the poster and play your song? And then we'll... Yeah. I use... Why don't, I don't know. But you have to play your music from over there. Right, I'll run. Okay. I can run over. Fast? Yeah. All right. I mean, I'm just going to talk really quick about it. Um, I don't have that much to say. But the thing that I thought was interesting about the project that I didn't really realized was going to happen. It really made me think about the idea of like community and what that is. This one in particular, this project was, you know, the AAPI print off. So it's the idea of this Asian American Pacific Islander community and what that is. And for me, it's like I never necessarily like identified myself as part of a, a, an Asian community so much. Um, and through this, through this project, I got um, connected with my elder who was um, Pacific Islander and she was from Hawaii. And she also didn't really identify as like a um, part of the Asian community. And it made me really think about what that is. And through the project, I kind of realized that it's, it was so little about the actual artwork and more about like building the idea of a community. So 
for, for me personally, it was like actually meeting this specific person and, and caring about this person. And uh, I realized pretty quick that we, you know, we, we were scheduled for three talks, but that this is going to keep going after these three talks. Like I'm, I'm invested now in this person. So um, I think that that's the long reaching effect of this one small project. You know, there was only actually three meetings with a, a person, but I can imagine that a lot of the other artists who were doing this also are building connections that are going to last you know, lifetime. So um, I was able to meet my elder, like super lucky that that happened because I'm here right now. I did this project while I was in Germany and she was in San Francisco. So we were doing uh, Zoom calls uh, internationally. And then just the other day, I got to actually meet her in person. So I'm going to play a little thing that I made. Yeah. Yeah. So relax. I think it's about three minutes. This is a picture of Andrew and Bernadette <laughs> meeting for the first time. Hi Andrew. Hi Bernadette. How are you? I'm alright, thank you. Hey, so nice to meet you. Yes. You oh, yes. So. Yeah, I'm glad to have met you, Andrew. Yes, and it's been a long time. I can't remember when we last spoke. Yeah, maybe about six months. Oh, six months ago. It seemed longer. It seemed, yeah. I was just telling my son. about what we're doing now, which is that we are starting this series of events called The Welcoming, such as this, um, in which we're just starting to work with the elders that we worked with over the pandemic and find events that we can bring, br like host events that the elders can be a part of. Yeah. So we did one event uh, at the new uh, KQED headquarters and Four of the L five, I don't know, four or five of the elders that we worked with over the pandemic came out 
to that event. It was so beautiful to find, you know, to have these moments where we've been connecting via Zoom and phone to finally be able to connect in person. Um, we're working, we've been working with Dr. G for a year. This is an elder, this is a commission through the Oregon Shakespeare Festival. They commissioned us to work with two elders over the course of a year. And we're super excited. I hope Dr. G doesn't watch this because this is a surprise for her. But what we're doing with OSF is we're creating this immersive bingo performance as a gift for her that it is also, the public is also invited. She's a bingo queen. She's like, she's an incredible human being, a civil rights activist, has like, you know, marched in Selma, just has these incredible stories of working with Dr. King, and now is like wanting to just retire and play bingo. And so this performance that we're creating is this immersive thing that the public is invited into, in which we like learn about her history, but then we also just play this game together. So it's really exciting to be like moving forward with our new elder, with our new elder friends, and to, and to feel that the kind of conversations that we've been having with them have really affected the kind of work that we're wanting to wanting to create. Um, San San, you want to come have a talk? Yeah, yeah. San San Kwan. <laughs> Should I leave that slide up? Yeah. Yeah. Hi. Hey. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, Erica, that was so moving and sweet and um, really appreciated everything you shared about your work. Really, really exciting and fun. Thank you. Um, hi, everyone. Um, so maybe what I'll do is ask you a couple of questions that allow us to have a conversation, and then we'll open it up in like 10 or 15 minutes. Sounds good. OK, cool. Um, so. Uh, the first question I have for you that I was thinking about as I was watching this slideshow is it was so moving for me not having actually been the cur one of the curated audience members for any of these projects, still really moving and touching for me to hear the stories about the projects that you clearly had created um, specifically for curated selected individuals. So I was wondering if you talk a little bit about what you think or what you've heard are the experiences of wide, of, of, of a wider public really um, on the, the, these projects that, are, again, you had created very specifically for individuals. Yeah, it's hard because in a way we haven't, I've, I, I have not wanted to think about it, right? Because, um, Making art is complicated because you have to like beg for money to make it, right? And you're all, you gotta be a hustle. You're just always asking in some way or another. You're whether that's like you're writing a grant or whether you're trying to get a theater to present your work. It's like this constant process of trying to get people to like be a part of these projects and often a way to be a part of that is through money. And so a lot of questions that funders have asked is around impact, right? And I think that that's, it's a fair question. We want to know where our money's going and we want to know the impact that it's going to have. And so what we've had to do is get really strong in ourselves about how we're shifting the way we're thinking about impact. Oftentimes in the field of performance, we think about like how many tickets are being sold and how many shows there are and how many people are going to, it's like how many people saw your show. And if it's a million, then that means your show is successful. And if it's 12, then that means your show is a stinker, you know? So it's really like measured by these kinds of numerics. So we've had to really make a claim that like what we're doing is measuring impact by the depth of experience, not the breadth of experience. And so as part of that for my own self, I've had to kind of not care really how it's moving the public and to recognize that actually like right now what I'm doing is really thinking about Haley and how I can make the best possible thing for Haley. And my measure of success is going to be around whether and how Haley engaged with this thing. 
And Haley might like totally hate the thing that we made for her, right? Like sometimes we get it wrong, but, but the measure of success is on, did I like engage with the material that I gleaned from our conversations to create the best possible thing? So now we're in this moment, Sansan, this is a long answer to your question, but for something like Dr. G's bingo extravaganza, where we spent a year just really only thinking about Dr. G and how we could just show up for her. And now we're realizing that we've actually been doing a year long, like dramaturgical ethnographic research process <laughs> towards a devised performance. We didn't know that we were doing that. And I think that that's happening across the board is that we've been, that we didn't realize that we spent the pandemic researching ways to create new work with new collaborators. And so I think it's yet to be determined. Dr. The Dr. G, the, the KQED event that we had was, you were there, was like a really lovely first kind of stab in that direction. Um, and I think that we'll learn more through this production with the Oregon Shakespeare Festival to really see how these stories kind of land um, and how we can use the experience of learning Dr. G to create a kind of transformational story for broader publics. Well, I mean, I can certainly attest that again, like just having learned about your work and then also watching this slideshow and hearing about it again, like it is having a larger impact on someone who didn't even actually see the performances, but I'm just hearing about the idea about the performances. So it, it, it is having that larger impact, I think. Um, and in addition, the ways in which, I mean, this title is called The Welcoming Four. So we know that there are like there are iterations that you're doing that are continuing to have impacts on larger and larger publics in, in addition to going deeper with that, that, that curated audience member. So just to attest that I think that it is having a larger impact and maybe it's not measurable in, in the ways that granting agencies typically measure impact, but it is having an impact. Well, I'm grateful that granting agencies, that we've been very lucky. Like, I feel like people are hungry for new ways of making, like people are recognizing the limits of what performance as it has existed can do, right? People are recognizing the limits of a kind of proscenium experience. And I think across the board, we're like, I'm seeing more and more that kind of regional theaters and granting agencies are look like dipping into these social practice modes as a way to like develop new kinds of new kinds of friendships. And I guess the, the impact that I hope it would have is that I hope you all like call your grandparents, <laughs> you know, I hope that I hope that you all like make a gift for your grandparents or your parents and you that we just kind of realize that these like artistic acts that we hold in our hands, these small gestures have like profound impacts So like take, do it. <laughs> So kind of another way to ask the same question um, is this, like I heard you saying that the pandemic hit and, um, and you conceived of this idea of artists and elders and you got a gazillion responses from artists because artists were feeling like they needed ways to feel productive and useful at a really difficult time. So I was wondering if you could um, riff a little bit on the ways in which these newer practices, these these more socially um, interactive practices that you're starting to develop, um, uh, change the ways in which artists can think about their usefulness. Yeah, I might. Okay, yes. So I, Rowena, who is one of my core collaborators, has been working with elder populations for a long time. And so I feel like she's just been incredible. She works, she, we worked with, um, she's a GBHI, Global Brain Health Institute at the University of San Francisco, a fellow there working specifically with um, people that have dementia and their caregivers. And for you got a grant to work with caregivers to look at caregiver burden. This is pre-pandemic. And so she has already kind of had her toes in that in that world. And my other collaborator, Ryan Takata, is just a freaking genius and a weirdo. And like every single thing that he does is an art project. <laughs> like everything that he does in the world is like, I made a piece. We're going for dinner. I made a piece. Let's go get gas. I made a piece. Let's go to Target. Like everything just feels like it's infused with a kind of creativity. And so I guess in response to your question, I just feel like it's just a broadening of this idea around what performance is and what performance can be. And I feel really blessed to have these collaborators who have already been thinking so broadly. I think I was the most kind of theater happens on a stage and I choreograph things in this particular, in this particular way. These two collaborators have just 
helped me, you know, and the circumstances of the world to kind of reimagine what performance can be and to know that we can like, that we can claim it. We can, we can decide that this, like, this is my solo. Isn't it amazing? We can claim that. <laughs> so it just was like a reclaiming. Um, I really like that idea of, of, of a reclaiming in it and giving, giving artists, um, the confidence to think about um, what they do and, and the way that it makes an impact on the world. Um, okay, so to go a little serious, um, we are a week from the anniversary of the Atlanta spa shootings. Um, you know, uh, the, uh, the assassinations, the killings of um, numerous Asian American women. Um, and of course, we're, he we're seeing, you know, two years of um, increased violence on Asian Americans, particularly women and elders. So um, asking you to think about um, why you, why you, created an iteration of your artist and elders project that was focused particularly on AAPI and wondering if you might want to think a little bit about yourself as what you might call an Asian American identified artist and an Asian American art. Do you think of yourself as an Asian American artist? Do you think about, um, if we're going to talk about impact, you know, what you do as something that might um, have an impact on the Asian American community? Do you have future projects in which you're thinking about your Asian Americanness? Anything like that? Hi, mom. That's my mom. She came from Korea, right? Like shortly before I was born. Uh, she met, this is my brother. What's up, Andrew? <laughs> it's a family affair up in here. Um, <sighs> Okay, first, first thing that I want to say around the launching of the great AAAP, the great AAPI elder print off. Um, oh gosh, mom, I hope this is okay to share. But my mom comes over one day and she's like, I have a, I have a two by four in my car by my, like right by my driver's seat. What the, f what the fuck? Like, oh, my mom's like seven, like my mom's, she has a like two by four. Like, what kind of wackadoo world is this? That my mom came to this country, like, really had, I, I mean, I think, didn't experience, mom, forgive me if this is, I think that this is true, that my mom, like, really didn't experience a lot of racism, like, jumped into junior college, like, made some, like, beautiful best friends, just had, like, a really solid life here, and then all of a sudden we're in this moment where my, like, 70 some year old mom to carry around a two by four, right? So that's like, that's, that's personal, right? That's personal. And so I think that I've always had a complicated relationship as my brother has talked about being like a half Asian person, right? Because I present and how I present and yet I hold this internalized identity and I'm definitely like raised by a Korean mom, right? But I, and I present in this way. And so there's always these questions of like belonging. Like I don't quite belong in these Korean spaces and I don't, I kind of belong in these ways. So you just kind of find yourself being like a little bit of a chameleon. Um, but when that, when my mom came over with her two by four, I was like, this feels different because it doesn't really matter. Like my own identity doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how I feel. It doesn't matter how I present. It matters that like there are these elders in my life that are having to carry around two by fours, right? And it matters that these elders that we worked with through LBFE are like many of them live, most of them live in like downtown San Francisco, Tenderloin, south of Market, right? That they're like, I don't want to leave my house right? This is what matters. And what matters is I have a lot of friends. I have a lot of like Asian American friends that again are like, I am ready to step up and I can do that. Like I can like pull that sh together. I can make that happen in a day. You know what I mean? In a day I can like get, many of the elders are monolingual, monolingual Cantonese and Mandarin speakers. So it was about, it was about finding artists that shared in the language. But the fact that I, that I, fact that like, that's, that's a muscle that I have. 
So what are you going to do? And in, in a way, I talked about this when I was making the work for my grandparents. Like in some ways, as there's early in my career, it was so much about me, you know, my work, my feelings, my breakup, my heart. But at a certain point, it was like, no, I, I, I kind of don't matter anymore. And I can actually do this thing that I, that I really believe is going to like improve the moment for a lot of people, for artists and elders. Like, let's be honest, those shootings were like devastating. And so many Asian, Asian American artists were like really struggling with no, I mean, uh, people, not just artists were like struggling with what to do. And the artists were really like, what can't, what, what, when we do, how can we organize? And I have to say out of that, like theater artists, performance artists, there was like a huge, there are so many gatherings of theater arts and performance artists coming together to think about what to do. So I feel really proud of the like quickness of that project. Ryan Takata, uh, who is my partner and for you, um, is half Filipino. So I think both of us were like, are we Asian? I don't know. Who cares? <laughs> Let's do this thing that we want to do. And so I think that it has been really um, like transformational for me because I don't know that I've ever... Like I always, I, you never know what box to check as a mixed race person. Like I don't know, I'm just me. And it's been pretty transformational for me to actually kind of claim that identity, maybe for the first time in my life. You know, for me to say like, yeah, that's actually something that I can that I can claim because there because there is a personal connection to it, and I claim it gently, and I claim it humbly, and I claim it with other parts of my identities. I'm Jewish. I think my mom made. It's like, we had, didn't we have the Korean food, like a sausage at my bat mitzvah? Like, you know, it's just bake. What was it, mom? Pork? What well, we had some kind of pork at my bat mitzvah. So like, there's many identities to be claimed. <laughs> Thanks for sharing. Uh, one last question. Um, so Erica has a show um, in our department, Theater, Dance, and Performance Studies. It opened last night. It's happening all this weekend. Um, it's called The After Party, um, and it's very, it's a devised piece, and it's very much in line with the kind of work that we saw in Erica's slideshow today. Co-directed by Haley. Co-directed by Haley. Um, <laughs> or assistant with, directed, with made music, by music. With music. Music by Andrew. By Andrew. Um, and uh, it's very much about hospitality and gift giving and um, uh, interactivity and a big, big old party. Um, so wondering if you want to talk about that show or about future work. That show has been such a joy, Haley and Andrew, to make with both of you. It's been, I, do you all like to go to the theater? <laughs> Sometimes, I don't know, the thing that, I, do you like to go to the, th will you come see my show? What's your name? Hi, my kid is eight and he loved the show and a four-year-old came and loved it also. I think I made a kid's show with some adult humor. I think that's basically what we've done. Uh, it was a joy to make and I think the thing that I feel most proud of is that the audiences are like unhinged. Like at least last night, the audiences were like screaming and singing a lot. Like it was really not polite, which I really, really really loved because um, I feel like sometimes the formality and the sterility of these kinds of spaces is like hard to cut through. So that's, I mean, we'll see how it goes tonight. It might be like totally cr crickets tonight, but maybe you'll all come and cheer us on. Any other uh, professional work you're doing? I'm going back, I spend a lot of time up in Oregon. So going back up to the Oregon Shakespeare Festival to work on a beautiful play called Revenge Song. Um, yeah, so working on that play and then, and then devising this piece, hopefully with, with Andrew and hopefully others, <laughs> the Dr. G, uh, piece, the bingo extravaganza. And so, uh, the revenge song will be running, I think from, it runs forever. It's in the Elizabethan, the outdoor theater, 1200 seat house, like big old thing. It runs, I think May through September. And then the Dr. G's bingo extravaganza runs in July. So if you make it up to Oregon and to Ashland, look us up. <laughs> cool. I think, are we ready to open it up? Let's do it. Let's do it. Questions. Hi, I have two questions. First one, where can we watch the show? Because, like, I don't know any details. Like, how do you get tickets? Where is it? The show for tonight? Yeah. Or go to the, Lisa, does it go, go to the TDPS website? Lisa, you probably have some. Yeah. I'll post it to our resources. Are you part of the class? Yeah. Yeah, I'll put it on the If you go to Theater Dance Performance Studies at Berkeley, there'll be information on it, the after party. 
Okay, cool. Thank you. Oh, wait, I had another. My second question is like a really big theme, I guess, amongst your work that you've been talking about is like gifting and like gratitude uh, and service for others. So, do you think, do you view this type of art as separate from art as self expression? Or do you think that art as self express, like that it has kind of morphed like into gift giving as self expression now? I don't know. Just I think that we can't help but express ourselves no matter what we do. You know, like I go to the grocery store and I'm like Trader Joe's, I'm expressing myself in Trader Joe's. So I think that, e that, that no matter what we create in the world, it's going to have our thumbprint on it. It's going to have our DNA. It's going to like carry some essential part of us. And so even if I try to like do something that feels like completely like I'm taking a ceramics class. I'm not good at ceramics, but it's really fun to do something that I'm like no good at it. But I'm finding that I'm finding it so deep because there are so many metaphors that happen around like centering the clay and like pulling it up and put like there's so many metaphors that happen within the techniques of ceramics. And like this applies actually to the way that I want to make performance. Like and so I think that it's I feel it feels to me like it's just a continuation. It doesn't necessarily feel like a a stop. Because I think no matter what, if you create a gift for somebody, it's gonna it's gonna reflect your interests and your aesthetics. It's a great question. Hey. They're making you work. You have to go up. I hope somebody all the way in the back. Let's just keep going all the way in the back. Raise your hand. We're going to make you work. OK. Hello. Hi. Um, so I was curious. So you were saying how you do some like performances in diners where you don't even ask permission to do anything. You just kind of go and then you like buy some like buy everybody coffee and like a donut those donuts were like four dollars and we had to buy a lot oh the budget goes yeah That's what it <laughs> i was just curious like what if they don't accept that coffee and donut like what do you do like you're in a diner and now somebody's like no like like the audience member? Yeah, like, you know, like, how do you, like, neutralize people? Well, we had somebody at that show, they're like, I don't want to do it. They ordered, like, a roast beef sandwich. And we're like, no, we, we made you a really nice dinner. You don't have to eat this, like, roast beef sandwich at the diner. That was just a one-time thing. So there's a diner called Silvercrest. It's in Bayview in San Francisco. It's a really cool diner. Y'all should go there. They have pool tables in the back and they have pinball machines. And basically it's always empty. <laughs> and so we thought this is the per and it has like cool neon signs. So this was just a one-time performance that we did at this diner. And, and oh yeah, and they had a big parking lot. And Andrew has a big old Mercedes and we wanted to do these one-to-one -one performances in the parking lot. So we had the performance site of Andrew's car where we had Phonique, the drag queen, give one-to-one -one tarot readings for all 12 of the guests. And then they also had this beautiful red wall on its exterior. So if Andrew turned on his headlights, we had Chris Black, who's a beautiful dancer, perform against this red wall in Andrew's light. So there were just all of these different sites around the diner. And we just thought, basically, we're not going to get in like, they're not going to ask us to go. <laughs> if we were to do it at Denny's yeah. in Emeryville, they'd be like, mm. <laughs> yeah, So it's basically just looking for places where you won't get busted. Makes sense. All right, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Two, I had two questions. One, well, one's more of a, asking for a comment, and then the other question, and... Um, for those of us who want to understand, say, the difference between how you make theater in a, a, a less interactive way, you know, with a script and all of that, can you can you help us understand the difference between what devising means as opposed to working with things that are already kind of materials that are already set? And then my second question would be, because we just had her with Susan Moffat, to mm. talk about your um, work that you did with her. Oh, I love that Susan came to speak with you all. Um, devised work is so fun. You all should do it because basically you can do anything you want. So devised processes like begin with the people that are in the room, right? You're like, I'm going to make peace and there's going to be these eight people. And often it's around a central theme. So we'll say, I'm bringing these eight people together and we are going to explore blank. What do we want to explore? Film. Okay, we're making a piece about film. So these eight people become co-researchers 
right? We all dig into film in the ways that make sense to us. For one person that might be, I'm only going to watch like all the Marvel movies. And for another person that it's going to mean like, I'm going to make a film. And for another person that's going to mean something like I'm going to like take film out of a camera, or, like old school film roles. And I'm just going to like lick it for five days and see what happens. Like we're all going to dig into film or somebody might be like, F -f -f -f. I love that. F -f -f. They're just going to like focus on the F, -f, -f the L or F. So everybody's going to find the thing about film that they're like, that's the thing that I'm most curious about. And then out of that, we're going to be like, hey, so you licked the film for five days. Now what? Like, how can we create a little moment out of that? And be like, oh, great, licking. OK, everybody, we're going to do a score around like licking the walls or licking ice. Let's do ice. So we're going to do a score around like licking ice. And all of a sudden, you have like eight performers with like these blocks of ice. And they're licking their ice. And one of them, they get their tongue stuck on the ice. And you're like, oh, that's an interesting theatrical moment. Let's follow that. OK, so I see that your tongue is stuck on the ice, which means that we need to stay in this moment for 17 minutes. So that means, sound designer, can you create a 17-minute sound score while the ice is like melting off this person's tongue? And all of a sudden, we have like this sound score. Oh, can the can the film score like actually pull from the Marvel Brothers movies that like Jimmy was totally into? So it's just like let like riffing off of all of these ideas. And so oftentimes my job as a director is that of editor because everyone's like, oh my God, I want to do this, I want to do it. Like it's really exciting. And I just like my favorite collaborators are like the what if people. You're like, what if, what if, what if? Like Ryan Takata identifies as a what if person. He uses the pronouns what if. <laughs> And so like that like that that what if spirit Right? So that means as a director, what I need to do is a create space, like create a space where people feel comfortable and excited to share their what ifs. Right? So that's like what kind of space do we all need to create together in order to feel excited to put our what ifs out into the world. My friend Danny always said, like you don't go to a playground. You know, like you don't. Go, you want to go to a playground as a kid, and some other kids like that's not how you swing. Then you're like, I'm not gonna swing anymore. Like you want to be like, that's a great. You're swinging great. Like if we think about it as a playground, and you're like, good job in the sandbox. You know, <laughs> like excellent job with that jump rope. Like just that it has that kind of spirit of play. Um, as opposed to coming in and creating work off of a script is totally awesome. Also because it's. A, like, it's just a very different kind of work. So you're like, wow, all I have to do is say these words in this order, and then from around there, I can do anything I want. But that, I kind of think of script as like a score, right? And as a like movement-oriented person, I think of how to like use that as a score for a kind of movement experience. And then Lisa, yeah, Susan Muffet um, was running, what Future Histories before that was called Global Urban Humanities. The Global Urban Humanities. So I worked there with, oh, yeah, right. Gigo Di Tomas. Lisa. It's all because of Lisa. OK, so Lisa invited me to work for Susan in like 2017. And I, so Susan brings together artists and scholars from different areas of the humanities to co-teach courses. And I taught with Gigo Di Tomaso, who is an architect. And Gigo and I had this wonderful time creating a series of performances at Costco and downtown Berkeley. And Lisa, I think, brought us together. And then Giga was actually the very first For You collaborator. So it's the first show that we did at the Marin Headlands was with Gigo and Rowena and Ryan. And since then, he's very busy doing, like, designing the streets of New York. But thanks for that, Lisa. <laughs> Um, I have a I have a follow up question. Yeah. Unless did someone raise their hand? Oh, you go first. Yeah, um, I just wanted to ask what your relationship with confidence and stage anxiety, stage fright has been. If you've al always had confidence. What if makes you think I have confidence? Like, what makes you th think that, like, you might, like, at what am I exuding confidence? Yeah, 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 yeah definitely. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> Sorry, I cut you off. Go on. Yeah, if that was, uh, s if, like, uh, stage fright was something you had to overcome or confidence was just something you've always had or something you had to cultivate. I love that question because I, do you have stage fright? I have, like, a tumultuous experience. 
I'm curious, like when, okay, I wanna, let's have coffee. Cause like when, do, like I'm just curious about these things around stage fright, about when we feel nervous and when we don't. And like, cause I feel like there's moments where I'm talking about something and I'm like, no, I actually believe that this thing needs to be said in this moment. And so it just wipes out the fear because you're like, actually, I have to say this because it has to be, that's why it's like filled with that sense of like this. And I, I could be wrong. People are like, why does she have to say that? Just, like I could be totally, and that's the, that's the, like those seeds of self doubt. Um, I, I, I don't think it ever goes away. I think that there's always a sense of nervousness and a sense of excitement. And I like to think that that's like a gift because it's like, it's exciting to be able to talk to people. I feel so grateful for the chance to talk to you and to, to like very selfishly, this is really awesome for me to like talk about the things that I'm really passionate about. And so I'm curious for you to track when you feel nervous, if that's what you're talking about and what, if you talk about the thing that like matters the most to you, how does that shift from when you're talking about like something that you care less about? I want to talk more about it though. I taught a public speaking class here and we used the Ted talk book, um, as a guide and it was actually really great. Hi. Hi. Uh, oh, hi. Hi. How are you? Come, what's your name again? Carly. Carly. Hey, Carly. Nice to see you again. Nice to see you again. You're so far from me now, though. No, I miss you. Miss you, too. Um, you talked a lot about kind of like your journey from doing work that was more um, self-based, you know, your experiences and how you had that moment of shift where you turned performances into more of a gift giving as an homage to your parents that kind of tumbled into an homage to bigger and greater communities that align with that. And my question is if that shift kind of resulted in a different feeling or a different reward um, in your kind of eyes as an artist. So the work that you were doing that was self-based, like how did you feel at the end of those performances in comparison to kind of shifting into doing work that is kind of for others and your, I guess, journey in, in that process. Cause I feel like I resonate a lot with doing work that is meaningful to me, but I find that the most meaningful work that I feel like I've done is when I do it for other people or I focus on groups of people that I deeply care about. And so I kind of am just curious on, how those things have shifted for you and I guess what was the most rewarding part of of kind of changing your artistic direction into that that realm I love that you asked that question Carly because then I because I think that I'm lying I think that I lied I think I lied to all y'all because I think that just the things that I the things that were of interest to me or the things that like fed me shifted right so I think that I'm gonna contradict myself and be like I'm still making work to process the things that are closest and nearest and dearest to my heart. It's just that those things have shifted and that I, yeah, that I, that I, that I, that I, um, maybe I'm becoming more like you, Carly, that like, like really understanding and feeling and being able to measure impact directly by asking somebody like, Hey, how did this experience move and inspire you? Like being able to have those kinds of conversations means more to me than it, than it did before. I'm, I'm like struggling to find my words right now, but I'm, I'm, I guess I'm feeling that it's like less of a, it hasn't been so much of a shift. Like in my mind, I've, I've been framing it as a shift, but as I say those words and as I hear your question, I'm like, actually it just again feels like an evolution and it feels like an evolution that just parallels like growing older, <laughs> growing up and a, a shifting of the priority, you know, and a shifting of energy and a shifting of focus. Like I, I, I think that we just, we change in our, in our lives and the things that keep us up at night change. And it used to be that my own, like my own shit would keep me up at night, but now it's other people's shit that keeps me up at night. <laughs> so maybe it's more just about following those middle of the night dreams and like building off of building off of those things that are keeping you up and that are, that you're, that you're like wrestling with through your dreams, you know? Thanks Carly.
Um, okay, so I had a, I did have a follow up question for how you're describing devised performance, and I, I this is based on Describe my, uh, sorry, devised oh. performance, and this is based on my insider intel knowing about your rehearsal process with the after af, the after party, not after the party. Um, so uh, you've got a guy who's got his tongue on the ice for 17 minutes. You've got Andrew playing music. You've got the Marvel soundtrack. And um, you've got it all structured out. And you know what's going to happen. The ice is happening first, and then Andrew, and then the Marvel soundtrack. And then your cast comes to you, and they go, what does it all mean? Oh, I love it. Yeah, Sansan, we talked about this. <laughs> Do you all know what table work is? So. I keep asking, I keep answering your questions like from around the bend. Let me go over here first. Um, so table work. When you when you start working on a play, you usually have like in the in the American theater, you have three weeks of rehearsal, right? And so usually, depending on the director, you spend a day or two or three. Some directors like to spend a whole week like sitting around a table and you read the play and you just talk about it and you talk about the big ideas and you talk about characters and you have all of this conversation about the kind of metaphors that are being explored. You talk about like the intention of the of the playwright. You talk about how specific actors are wanting to respond to their roles. But when you're doing devised work, you can't, you don't have that, you don't have a script to respond to at the top. You have these, you have a bunch of what ifs and you have a bunch of like abstract esoteric ideas that you're chasing in the middle of the night, right? So one thing that we learned in this latest process with the after party is that we, we had three weeks to make this new piece, which is like the fastest ever. So we did our first run through after two weeks. So I'm Imagine we had so that's ten days that we had together. So on day one, you're meeting all of these new people, and you, that you've never met in person before. And then on day ten, you're like, let's. Or maybe it was day nine because it was a Thursday because it was before you had to go to LA. It was day nine we did our first run through. So then at the end of day nine, we did our run through, and I'm like, y'all, that was so good. It was great. We're on to it. We're saying a thing, and and the students are like, what? Not all of them. But they were like, what are we saying? What are we doing? And I felt like so excited to just like stop, like to actually on day 10, then stop making and stop rehearsing. And we had this beautiful day where we just went through the piece beat by beat. And we're like, OK, beat number one. Like, let's talk about this person, Cece, holding a pinata. Let's like that's the first image. Let's talk about pinatas. Let's talk about pinatas as like a fragile thing that is made of paper, a fragile hopeful. Let's talk about unicorns. It's a unicorn pinata. Let's talk about pinatas as a thing that people have to like bash with a stick to get their candy. Like so much inside of a pinata. We went through beat by beat and kind of dissected the whole of this piece and just did the table work kind of two weeks in. And so it was just kind of beautiful learning to be like, actually, because we don't, we don't normally stop to reevaluate that late in the process. And I, I, I felt so grateful that the students had asked that question because it gave us a chance to enter into week three, our final week of rehearsal with like a sense of like um, confidence in what they were doing. And I think each student would describe the piece in really different ways. Right? Like each person that's involved in the production would describe it differently, and that's a okay. It's like as long as they feel like they're able to step into that material with a sense of confidence and uh, and clarity. I think I think that's a really great place to end. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Thank nice you, everybody. Thank you. Mm -hmm.